Hello. Thank you for joining us today into the, for today's webinar, Lighting Design, Wellbeing, and the Education Environment, sponsored by Cree Lighting. My name is Stephen Averitt, and I'll be a moderator today. Before we begin, a few words about this webinar technology. Uh, this platform allows our audience to be more involved with the presentation, and more importantly, allows you to watch this event the way you want to watch it. Uh, to begin, feel free to customize your webcast console. You can move windows around by dragging on the title bar or resize your windows by clicking in the lower right corner of any window. You'll notice a toolbar at the bottom of your console. These buttons allow you to open and close widgets on your screen. If at any time you experience difficulties with the audio or advancing of the slides, simply press your F5 key to refresh, refresh your webinar console. We encourage you to ask questions at any time using the Q&A widget on the left side of your screen. We will address as many audience questions as possible at the end of the presentation. We appreciate your feedback, so please click on the survey icon and complete the form at some point during the webinar. Now I would like to introduce today's presenter. Jeff Hungarder is the Director of Commercial Indoor Lighting with Cree Lighting. With 20 years of experience in commercial lighting, Jeff is working every day to develop exceptional lighting solutions to deliver a better light experience. Jeff is a member of the Illuminating Engineering Society, or IES, and has a bachelor's degree in marketing from Western New England University with a master's in business from Friday Dickinson University. With that, let us begin. Over to you, Jeff. Thanks, Steve. So thanks everyone for joining. Uh, we're gonna try and make this as fun and interactive as we can as we go through this. Um, the idea around this is obviously focused around you know lighting for learning and education spaces. So you know we're gonna go through all sorts of things about uh, lighting for applications, uh, things to consider in, in design lighting. And then we'll dive into some of the new topics like health and wellness and how that relates to lighting design um, as we see, you know, new designs uh, for the future. So please uh, use those Dropbox to ask questions and we'll uh, answer those uh, at the end of the uh, presentation. So with that, let's dive right in. So, you know, when we think about education, you know, we have to think about, you know, the spaces within uh, education, right? So if we think of K through 12, you know, we think of, you know, hallways and libraries, gyms and auditoriums that uh, often become flexible spaces used for, you know, not only sporting events, but also gym class and potentially, uh, you know, the, the annual Christmas, uh, the annual Christmas show. So it, it, ways in which we decide how we light those spaces uh, is very important. When we talk about higher education, you talk about uh, places like athletic fields, lecture halls, and then you get into even some site and area applications, right? Because you're you're basically in a university setting, um, creating a almost a residential setting as well as your commercial indoor setting. So uh, it's all very important as we look to you know how we how we look to design uh, lighting for these spaces. And if we look specifically at some considerations uh, for the classroom. Uh, spaces can vary greatly, even similar spaces across uh, different age levels. Uh, so the types of learning that happen in an elementary school uh, versus a high school obviously are, are very different. Um, a lot more laptops, a lot more uh, PowerPoints being shown in devices uh, in, in the high school and, and the college level, and much more hands-on, you know, paper, pen, pencil, um, and art type uh, materials in that elementary and middle school. Uh, so things that you need to consider is, you know, again, you know, looking, uh, reading a chalkboard from a certain distance away, you know, what types of reflections are you going to have uh, that you need to account for? Reflection off the desk surfaces, reflection off the floor, off the walls, what color uh, are, are some of those things as well? So those are all things that we need to take uh, into consideration. So. Even those tasks uh, within the same space can require different light levels. So even if you look at, you know, an elementary school specifically, uh, you generally are in most likely not changing classrooms as often as you would in, in high school or, or in university. Um, and so that one space is going to be kind of a multi-use space. So it's going to be for the, the you know, the, the reading time, the test taking, and problem solving uh, on on the board on the whiteboard, so those are all things that you know when we look at you know designing to certain uh, foot candle requirements or luminance levels, uh, things we need to take into account. So if you're not familiar, um, and we won't go too deep into this, but how do we, how do we define those light levels, right? How, how do we understand 
what is the required light level, you know, for a classroom or for a hallway in an education facility. Um, the IES, which is uh, basically the sets the standards and, and works um, to design out uh, what these different spaces uh, sh should look like. Um, they put all this together in RP3-13 called Lighting for Education Facilities. So if you're interested in some nighttime reading, uh, obviously this is going to go very deep into understanding, um, you know, lighting design practices and what those, um, you know, what those requirements need to be for all those different spaces. Again, these are recommended practices and these are based off of all the different um, individuals uh, that contribute into the IES, uh, lighting designers, engineers, uh, people that are doing different types of research and measurements on, you know, what is that appropriate amount of light um, and how does it need to be uh, designed in to give people the, uh, the most comforting experience. So kind of two different uh, considerations for the classroom, right? So if we look at it from a lighting for the task versus designing for visual comfort. So lighting for the task really focuses on kind of a vertical foot candles, meaning, you know, you need a certain amount of illumination to read uh, a textbook or to take a test or to see the teacher. Um, and that's obviously important. Um, the way you, the way you light your space that the presenter or the teacher is uh, kind of the focal point of the room. Uh, but also it's important that we design for visual comfort. And so when we talk about that, it's, you know, reducing the amount of strain on the eye. So looking at, you know, these low glare options, um, how do we use indirect lighting, right? Bouncing light off of another surface to create a more softer visual, visually comforting light. Or how do we create a, a lens um, that can diffuse the light and break it up so that, you know, you're still getting the amount of light you need, but it's, um, again, not causing uh, eye strain or discomfort, uh, you know, when you're in a space for, you know, eight, you know, six to eight hours uh, in a day. So lighting for task, if we look at that, um, again, making sure when you're looking at, at what types of products or how you would do that, you want to make sure that you're looking at different types of lumen packages, right? Because in all of these different spaces, your, your ceiling heights and the foot candle requirements are going to be um, a lot different, right? So we talked about before some of those flexible spaces, a standard classroom versus an art room, for instance. Um, in an art room, you may need higher foot candles or you may, or you may want you know, a, a different color rendering to uh, really see the colors and, and really you know, have that high visibility. Uh, whereas in a standard classroom, you, know, you may only need 30 foot candles at the desk or maybe even lower depending on if it's a, a computer room or, or tech room or something like that. So that's important that, you know, looking at that choice, you understand that whatever product you're looking to put in, whether it's a linear or a downlight or, or a trough or type product, um, that, you know, you have those op that optionality to make sure that you're not boxed in uh, too much to uh, only one lumen package, so that you have some flexibility there. Um, obviously, the ability to create different shapes um, is really opening up this design space for de lighting designers and, and, and architects when they're looking at how they design or, or renovate some of these spaces. So, you know, you can see here in this picture, you know, you really almost have the lighting is designed into the architecture. So it's very minimal. Um, it's, it's almost invisible or hidden. And it's not too bright that it's, you know, causing, uh, uh, you know, hot spots or, or, or large amounts of glare. So having that flexibility in design uh, across a portfolio is, is very useful as well. And then we'll talk a little bit more about um, color rendering, but really that has to do with um, you know, how, how objects, you know, how close they look to, to what they really look like in terms of color. And that, that metric right now is based off of kind of the sun you know, being 100. So if you think about it like an incandescent lamp that you have in your house, um, that's pretty much 100. So it's, it's, it's true to... Um, you know, as, as true to the sun being something under the sun as it could. Um, most of the commercial lighting out there is, you know, between 80 and, and 90 to 95 CRI. So it gives you pretty good uh, color rendering. But again, these are choices that you may want to look at. Uh, again, for an art room, you may want the highest CRI uh, color rendering possible because you want to make sure that those colors 
um, a midnight blue versus a dark blue are, are actually two different colors. And you want to make sure in an art class that, you know, you have that understanding of, of what those colors look like. Um, but in a standard, uh, you know, classroom, maybe an 80 or 85 CRI is, is acceptable. Um, and then if we kind of switch that up and, and we look at designing for the visual comfort aspect, right? So the task aspect is, okay, you know, we have a task, we need to get these things done. We need to take tests. We need to, you know, have a reading time. We need to do math. Now we talk about the other side of making sure that the people in the space um, are actually comfortable. And in regards to lighting, you know, how we would do that is, uh, is, is designing for visual comfort. So there's a, what we call a, a UGR, uh, which is a glare rating. Uh, it's been used in Europe for a long time, just starting to be uh, used in the United States. Uh, and again, this all has to do with, you know, not creating hot spots off coming off of, um, obviously out of the fixture, but also, you know, off of the objects in that room. So creating kind of a low glare environment. Uh, suspended lighting obviously gives you a great soft reflectance, meaning, you know, you're using the ceiling tiles or you're using, you know, some type of hard ceiling to reflect off of the wall. And that allows uh, for just more of a softer glow and to spread that light a little bit more evenly. And then, you know, we'll talk about a little bit later, but how controls can really allow for some of these flexible spaces um, that can be adapted over time. So again, if you think about a school that doesn't have the budget, you know, they're, they're growing in, in terms of size, but they don't have the budget to, you know, put on a new expansion. Uh, you know, the controls aspect will allow you to take a space and make it adaptable, meaning, you know, for the first half of the day, maybe it's art class. For the second half of the day, um, it's used for science class. And having controls, uh, you know, being very simple to understand with a touchpad on the wall, uh, will allow the teacher in that space to have these preset modes where they can simply press a button and they can see the environment change, right? So the color temperature might become a little bit cooler and the light levels may increase once it's uh, science class versus the button for art class. They just can touch the button on the wall and the light levels come down a little bit and maybe uh, the, the color temperature becomes just a little bit more neutral or, or a little bit warmer. Um, so again, these are, you know, great ways to think about um, when you're looking at designing into these uh, classroom spaces. So some of the highlights, um, you know, why controls, right? So beyond obviously the teacher, you know, having the ability uh, or, or whoever's in that space, the moderator to, you know, have control of the lighting, you know, basically creating a, a flexible space. Um, there's things like code compliance, right? So in many, most states, there's uh, there's certain local codes where you need to have a certain amount of energy savings beyond just the the move from fluorescent to LED technology. Uh, and then there's additional savings that you can capture, things like occupancy occupancy detection, right? So if no one's in the space, the lights turn off. Things like daylight harvesting, which basically uh, is the sensor and the fixture utilizes sun that's coming in through the windows or any other light that it's picking up. And it can actually dim the lights and basically get to kind of a certain uh, light level and maintain that light level, whether or not, you know, depending on how much sun is coming in, right? So if there's a lot of sun coming in at a certain part of the day, the lights will dim, right? And it will give the people in the classroom still that 30 foot candle minimum. But if uh, the clouds come in and there's a big storm, those light levels will automatically raise up in the classroom uh, to account for the loss of the sunlight that it no longer has. So again, some additional savings there. You can also do things like task tuning and dimming. Uh, dimming is pretty, uh, you know, pretty clear, right? You have a, a dimmer on a wall that you know you can actually just go over and dim if you're doing a presentation. Uh, task tuning really has to do with again kind of that idea of what task is happening at what time. And you can actually just set kind of these these trim levels uh, to make sure that you're getting the right amount of light and you're not wasting light uh, or energy uh, when you don't need it. And then again, we talked about that added flexibility uh, for changing spaces. So definitely some considerations to have. 
these are some products that can actually do some of the things that we just talked about, right? So you're talking about uh, something like a basket troffer, specifically in the K through 12 space where budgets are are you know a little bit more stringent. Um, this is a, a very budget friendly uh, type option with a, a very um, high diffuse lens, uh, giving you really good uh, downlight and really giving you good uh, vertical and horizontal foot candles uh, for the classroom space. Uh, and then a lot of new projects are, are going to go more linear, uh, and that's a trend that we're seeing. And again, a little bit more expensive uh, depending on what type of linear you go with, but uh, you, know, you can see a lot of suspended direct and indirect light fixtures. And again, these are great options to reduce glare and increase the visual comfort of the space. So, you know, we see a lot of this in the universities, um, colleges, uh, high schools, where, uh, you know, the students, um, you know, th there tends to be a little bit of a larger budget for those applications. Um, but again, both of these options, you know, could be used anywhere in that, uh, in the varying education facilities. So let's move to out of the classroom uh, into uh, a great uh, a great part of the school, which is the gymnasium. Uh, we all had some good times there. So, looking at how gymnasiums differ, you know, in K through eight versus high school and college, you, you might not think about it from a, a lighting design perspective, but these needs are, are actually going to vary pretty greatly. Um, you know, if we look at K through eight, again, these are the multi-purpose spaces. These are the playground, the lunchroom, it's a theater, um, it's the dance hall, and it's also uh, on the weekends, probably the basketball court uh, for, the, for the local basketball teams. So, you know, a great design tip for these spaces is to illuminate to the highest uh, illuminance level uh, intensity necessary and then provide a dimming system, right? So, you know, you wanna be able to capture, you know, the, the, the events that need lots of light, like a, like a basketball game, but you also wanna be able to have the ability to easily dim those lights when you're putting on you know, your, your Christmas pageant or some other type of function where you want the lights um, to be dimmed. And then if we look at high school, again, probably still using that space for multi you know, different activities um, probably a little bit less varied than in the K through eight. Uh, and here you're looking at obviously, you know, the basketball games, gym class, potentially a graduation um, or an orchestra, you know, you, you might have your band practice uh, or a band, uh, you know, that's happening in that space. So again, that's, uh, you know, somewhere where you're gonna need a little bit more light. Uh, but also if you're trying to create some type of theater production, you're gonna wanna have the ability uh, to dim those lights as well. Uh, as we get up into the universities, you know, you can imagine there's less variation uh, in these sporting events. So you're talking about, you know, Division Three uh, versus a Division One, right? Where Division One, you know, you're really, you know, it's a much larger space. It's something that's going to be on television, right? So you need to have uh, the the perfect illumination, not just on the floor, but you know, also you want to see the commentators, the fans, um, and so it's very important when looking at this to understand, you know, having, spending a little bit more money uh, because obviously, you know, these things are really important to, you know, attracting new students and keeping students. And then, you know, obviously in these spaces, you know, we have to think about and consider glare, right? We, we want to pour lots of light onto the basketball court or onto the volleyball court, um, but we can't ignore the fact that at some point, the people playing or the people in the stands are going to have to look up uh, for different reasons, right? So we can't just take, you know, full-on point sources with LEDs and, and not think about adding reflectors or diffusers to them uh, because that's obviously going to cause some discomfort and, you know, it's going to be blinding for the students as, uh, as they play, uh, you know, in these different events. So, again, that's why when you, when you look at some of these high bay options, you can see, you know, depending on if you have a reflector, which is obviously going to help do a little bit of that diffusion because it's going to kind of reflect and refract that light. Um, but a lot of times you're going to want to go with a conical uh, lens, right? And that's going to help give you even a little bit more diffusion um, so you're not creating any of those glare hotspots. 
And these are just, you know, again, and, and when you're thinking about that, obviously there's a visual comfort side, but then there's the, you know, safety side, right? And so we we know that, uh, you know, especially in those gym classes, those, you know, the, the balls tend to get thrown all over the place, right? So, you know, making sure that you understand what's going to be done in that space is very important. Um, and, and that you have things like a full body wire guard or a safety cable or even something like a swivel pendant so that if something does get hit, it's not so rigid that it's not going to give at all. It's going to, you know, it's going to allow for that fixture to kind of move, you know, sway side to side, if you can imagine that, um, so that, you know, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't cause any safety concerns. And so you can imagine looking at, um, you know, a, a, a basketball court. Uh, here's kind of looking, you know, from an old system to a new system, right? So if we look at a metal halide system, 400 watt, you can see here there's definitely some dark spots. Um, you know, the, the colors on the floor are not as, um, it's not as, as yellow, right? So the, the true colors of the red are, are not really coming out. And then every so often you can see some of those hot spots. If you see those white dots that are on that side, you can see on the left side, um, obviously that's, you know, that's a part of the, uh, the light fixtures. Uh, and this was uh, retrofitted with, you know, a, a KBL high bay um, that, that we actually made. And you can see where, you know, that color is, you know, the, the illumination for one is a lot more consistent across the whole court. Um, those hot spots are, are pretty much all gone and the colors render uh, a lot truer, right? So that, that wood looks a lot richer and that red also looks a little bit warmer. And so it's actually, you know, it's actually conveying more the actual probably school colors um, that that uh, the university really has. And again, if we look at, you know, gyms for multi-purpose, um, so there's obviously different types. You know, if you're doing a one-for-one -one, uh, with the old technology, you know, we, a KBL is, is probably going to be your, your best fit. Um, because that's a point source, and a lot of times in design, you kind of want to if you're if you're designed in with a point source, you want to stick with a point source. Um, but there's a lot of fluorescent high bays out there as well. So we also offer kind of a linear uh, high bay as well. Uh, and again, that will just allow you to kind of keep that spacing that you have per fixture. Um, so again, it, you won't necessarily have to redesign the whole ceiling if you're doing some type of retrofit or renovation. So if we look at, you know, some of the, the, the advantages of, of going LED in, the, in this kind of type of space, you know, we're going to see things like, you know, impact resistant uh, polycarbonate reflectors, you know, lumen packages up to 30,000, um, no more lamps and ballasts to maintain, right? So again, you know, you're not having to go up, you know, every 10 or 12,000 hours uh, to replace a, a lamp. And then really the, the unique part of this is now we're getting into this whole controls discussion, right? So you can have your, your fixtures in your gymnasium talking to other fixtures in the education space. So talking to fixtures in the classroom, talking to fixtures in the cafeteria, they can all be scheduled together and you can control them through an interface where, you know, one person, the facility manager or, um, you know, somebody in that space has the control to set scenes, scheduling, um, and that can be accessible, you know, through either through your computer or potentially through your phone, depending on which type of control system uh, you go with. So, again, there's lots of benefits to um, the LED technology with added controls. So let's jump more into, you know, we've really focused around lighting from the design aspect, from lighting design and what types of, um, you know, fixtures you might look to use and, 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 you know, how you would design for task versus visual comfort. Now we're going to jump into kind of a newer topic, and that's more around the lighting for health and well-being. Um, so this is kind of a new, it's not new necessarily, but it's, it's become more lively in the discussions around um, health and wellness and and how we and how lighting kind of fits into that. So we are all kind of instinctively you know drawn to light. Um, but you know in the past, we've kind of looked at, okay, you know lighting as as a form of electricity, right? Utilizing electricity um, to to get a an end result of of light. And I think what you know we're seeing and what we're hearing through different different types of research is that, um, you know, by doing this, we've, we've kind of lengthened our days and we've shortened our nights. 
Um, and we'll talk about what that means as, as we move forward. But, you know, before lighting, you know, before electricity, obviously, you know, there were candles, there were fires, there were other things, um, but those weren't always as easily accessible, um, especially in residential applications or, or in the workplace. And so now with LED lighting, um, you know, it just opened up a lot of possibilities. So if we look at, you know, obviously Thomas, Thomas Edison, um, back in 1880, you know, they, they started marketing and there's some debate, right. Of, of you know, who created, who, who invented the light bulb, but he really was the first to come to market, um, with the, with the DC current. Uh, and that's really what popularized the idea of, of lighting. Um, by 1900, 60% of the U S population was still rural. So a lot of that um, electricity was really being done in the cities because it was easy to, um, you know, create those those connections uh, and the cost kind of made sense for the amount of people um, that could experience the light. By 1925, half the homes um, had electricity, right? So this was, even though 25 years probably seems like a long time, um, that was actually a pretty fast transformation uh, of being able to um, pull electric light. Uh, into uh, into these uh, people's homes, but you know, before electric light, we had brighter days and we had darker nights. Um, so you think about most people spent more time outside. Uh, you know, before we had electric light, and at night, you know, you didn't have um, uh, light pollution or, or you know, you know, from especially outside of cities where you see these. You know, kind of, you can see the glowing, the glowing cities, right? Um, so you didn't have that, and and so you know, again, that made for them to kind of, you know, get synchronized uh, on a different circadian rhythm than uh, most of us uh, are on today. And now, as we know, uh, longer longer days are are kind of relatively a new phenomenon in terms of you know, in the last let's call it, you know, 50 to, to 60 years uh, of our evolution, right? So today we have different problems. Um, you know, in the past, the problems were that at, you know, six or seven o'clock, your workday was done. There was nothing else to do. Um, now, you know, obviously we have people that are working night shifts that are working overnight. Uh, we have weekend warriors that, you know, uh, sleep during the day and, and work well into the night. Um, but that means that you know, our days are not bright enough and our nights are not dark enough. Um, and we can talk a little bit about, you know, what that means, but basically, you know, when we're inside, uh, for most of the day, we're probably not getting the amount of light, um, that our, that our brain, you know, that our eye needs to actually get to entrain our circadian in the right way. And at night, uh, you know, with tablets and, and phones and, you know, watching, you know, these big screen TVs until, you know, 10 or 11 at night, um, our bodies aren't, uh, necessarily, uh, uh, able to shut down, uh, as quickly as they need to when we need to get sleep, which is obviously very important for, uh, melatonin creation, which we'll talk about here in a second. So you probably heard about uh, circadian rhythm and melatonin. So, I mean, I won't go too deep into, you know, what they are, but obviously the circadian rhythm is how you, how your body relates to day and night and understands that during the day it needs to be awake and active. And at night it needs to kind of shut down and create that, uh, create that melatonin creation. So obviously lighting plays a, a huge role in that, not only, uh, artificial light, like we're talking about here, but also, um, you know, daylight, right? And so there's, you'll see varying uh, different people. If you measure someone that lives maybe in Seattle versus someone that lives uh, maybe in California, right? Because the amount of natural light um, that those people are getting is 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 very different, and uh, that can affect uh, lots of different things, which which we'll talk about here. So. Circadian also can affect um, things like, uh, obviously, through jet lag, right? So, um, obviously, most of us think about jet lag as, you know, flying from into, you know, across varying time zones and how the body just can't functionally keep up with um, with what's going on. And so, sometimes in the middle of the afternoon, um, if you flew to, you know, Europe or something, you're going to all of a sudden start to feel tired and, 
your body is going to be a little bit out of sync. But there's also things like social jet lag, um, and that has to do with you know think about teenagers that maybe stay up all night and then they're trying to you know go to school the next day, uh, and you know by two o'clock in the afternoon uh, they're they're falling asleep at their desk, right? So um, this effect isn't just related to you know specifically jet lag, um, but there's also something we call jet, uh, social jet lag, which can affect um, kind of an everyday, uh, the everyday activities of, of a person or a student. So what functions uh, are controlled by the circadian clock, right? So we understand kind of the, the general idea of, of circadian rhythm and how that works. But um, if we look at the function specifically, it's more than just visual. And you know, a lot of this in the last few decades has has come to light about all the different um, uh, effects that um, that lighting uh, can control. So this is not all of them uh, because that would that would take um, probably longer time than 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 we want to be on this webinar for. But um, again, these are some of the ones here where you can see things like sleep, mood, motor activity, memory. Um, you know, your peripheral clocks, obviously. The hormones in terms of that creation of melatonin, which is very important um, to kind of keep that creation on a on a on a cyclical clock. So these are um, these are just some of them. And if you think about it, uh, this clock, circadian clock, it it kind of is acting like the you know the orchestra conductor. Um, it's enabling the expression of all these physiological activities at the right time. Um, your alertness and cognitive performance, um, some of your memory, your body temperature, um, even your blood pressure, you know, are at the highest when you're awake. So it's very important, obviously, that, you know, these signals are all getting communicated. Um, and then on the flip side at night, you know, you have that secretion of the hormone melatonin, muscle relaxation, right? So you're getting, you're, you're calming, not just, you know, the, the brain, but um, the actual muscles and then sleep pressure. Um, those are all at the highest at night, right? So there has to be something that is helping, you know, communicate these messages um, back and forth. So, you know, the circadian system, it's involved not only in the control of cell division, but also in the, in the repair uh, of DNA. So again, these are just more and more just beyond being able to see something and, and you know, the visual impact of something. These are all these other physiological effects um, that we need to take into consideration. Um, and someone getting desynchronized, meaning kind of getting off their circadian clock, um, can actually be responsible for some very negative, um, you know, health effects, such as um, a prevalence of certain types of cancer uh, in shift workers. And, and there's tests uh, and, and research that's been done um, that shows that someone that's potentially worked shift work their whole entire life uh, has a higher propensity uh, of certain types of cancers because they're not getting that melatonin creation, um, uh, you know, as they need it, right? And and that melatonin has been shown to actually, again, you know, with cell repair and things like that. So it's actually, you know, in in a way, um, can inhibit. You know, some of uh, you know a cancer from either you know spreading or or um, even starting in in different types of scenarios. So I think the key is, you know, the human eye is not just for seeing, um, and we've probably taken that for granted for a long time, uh, or maybe we've thought about it, but we've never gotten too deep. But you know, now we know that there's research. Um, you know, the incoming light comes you know through a light spectrum uh, through the the front of the eye goes all the way to the back and you know um, you know some of the research that's been found in the last few decades uh, one of the big ones is this um, this photoreceptor that's been found and, and kind of how much it actually is affecting some of these phys physiological effects so the um, IPR GC which is the photoreceptor you can see it sits right on the on the back um, of the eye wall that obviously is sending lots of signals about melatonin suppression and circa circadian clock reset. So, you know, again, <clears throat> just at a high level, this is just talking about the fact that, um, 
you know, more than just visual, we have to really think about the effects when we're designing for light. And of course, there are going to be challenges, right, um, for lighting designers and practitioners for designing for visibility and well-being, right? So um, you're you're actually taking um, the illumination at the task, and you're trying to, you know, balance it with the recommendations for human health about, you know, how much stimulus you need at the eye. Um, now, how you will weigh these is intensity. You know, obviously that's how strong the light is, the spectrum of light. So you're talking about like a spectral distribution, and, you know, the different wavelengths of light, which is how you get all the, di the different visible colors, the distribution of the light, meaning are you getting what they call a, a, a Lambertian distri distribution, which is light just kind of falling downward, uh, or are you getting, you know, maybe a bat wing uh, distribution, which is actually forming very directional light. Um, that is, you know, putting light, you think about um, maybe a, a library in an education facility where down a, a library, um, you know, all the, all the different kind of hallways in the library, you're going to want to maybe have a bat wing that's putting light all the way up on the books and putting cascading light, you know, from the top of the bookcase all the way down to the bottom. And you're not necessarily needing a ton of light down the middle of that hallway, uh, because you're getting reflectant light for the person to walk down, but really you're trying to put most of that light so that people can read what the titles of those books are. And then duration, right? So that's that's going to be uh, hugely important as well. How long are you going to be underneath this light? And so, you know, those four factors are going to be really important as you balance between the idea of, vis of visibility and well-being. So you may question and say, yeah, I've heard, I, I've kind of read some of this. It seems like maybe it's too early. Um, it's too complex. There's lots of research out there. Uh, you know, I'm not sure if, if, if it's the right time to start thinking about this. And I'm here to tell you that, um, in fact, it is. This is actually the perfect time uh, because there is still a lot of research that needs to be done, but there has been a lot of research that has already been done over the last few decades. And what we've learned uh, for that is obviously, you know, we don't want to do do any harm. Uh, and so, you know, while we look at things like glare, visual comfort, um, we look at things like uh, color rendering and, and trying to balance between, you know, health and visibility, um, there's lots of things that, you know, we know uh, through research that can give us good direction and guidance. And we're going to talk about you know, what some of those um, guidance measures are in the next few slides. So everybody wants a little bit of guidance, right? We don't want to just go out and, and kind of make assumptions, um, just, you know, find some things on YouTube and say, hey, that looks, that, that sounds right, um, and, and put those in the building, right? So we need some type of guidance for lighting for well-being. So obviously the IES, um, again, which is, you know, creating those recommended practices, they have a technical committee, which is uh, Light and Human Health, to work on the new recommended practice for kind of daytime alertness, which is TM18, uh, reaffirmed. And then, you know, they're obviously continuing to look at, you know, working with well building, which we'll talk about here in a second, but to really start to look at what are those um, recommended uh, design practices um, if we're talking about, again, combining the lighting design side with the health and wellness side. Um, UL, which is again a safety uh, uh, group within uh, lighting, also uh, has their design guides for uh, promoting circadian entrainment. And then we'll talk about a little bit more about well building. Uh, but again, there are 10 different concept areas in well building. So, you know, it's not just lighting, uh, but lighting obviously is one of those, and it's very important to uh, hitting that criteria. So for well building, um, right now it's on well version two, uh, which was um, released in 2018. There are 10 concept areas. Um, we won't go into some of these other things, but really the focus on these, these 10 concept areas. And you know, what you can see here is obviously light is uh, one of them. And in addition to that, you can see things like air quality, water quality, um, nourishment, materials. Um, that, that could be things like you know, noise dampening, um, 
you know, noise dampening fixtures or, or noise dampening ceiling tiles, um, community, thermal comfort. So all of these things um, have to come together and there's metrics around uh, what all of these things need to do to kind of get the check mark. And um, it's, you, you can't just do one of them. Um, you need to do uh, basically you know, meet all of these criteria so that you can get um, that, that approval for well building. And again, a lot of the new designs that are coming out for new construction schools um, are looking at designing to this well building standard. Um, which again is just going to make for a much you know healthier and, and happier uh, learning environment. So you can you know again Google this uh, and, and and you know read a little bit more into you know everything behind it, but um, it really is about creating a, a building ecosystem um, that is giving the people in that space um, the best ability to complete the tasks while they're in that space. So whether that's education or office, um, you know, it's going to lay out some different requirements for what that needs. It also has things like, uh, like luminaire, uh, information. So again, you know, as you go and look to choose what luminaires you're going to use in each of your spaces, there's going to be requirements around your spectral data, the luminance data, which is, you can find that in your IES files, which basically gives you your, um, your lighting layout plots when you're trying to lay out about how many fixtures you need for a certain uh, certain space. And then it's going to talk about this color measurement, right? We talked about CRI, um, but also TM30 is kind of a new metric. Um, and again, TM30 goes into a little bit deeper uh, color analysis of what your objects and people are going to look like under that space. So again, I would, I would um, you know, recommend you know, if you're interested, you know, diving a little bit deeper, you know, just Googling TM30 and IES, there's a lot of information um, that you can learn about about color and, and how that's being measured. And so here's just a quick list of kind of, you know, we talk about some of the preconditions that are mandatory um, and the summaries, right? So I won't go through all of these, but basically it, it's, it's giving you an idea that um, you need to provide for the visual and comfort enhance acuity for all users. Um, you need to obviously provide access to, you know, indoor light exposure and light education. And then we get into things like, you know, if you're trying to design a circadian lighting design, uh, what does that look like? What are, what are the kind of qualifications that you need for that? Things like glare control, visual balance, um, and then obviously things like occupancy control um, so that individuals can customize uh, the lighting to their specific requirements. So another metric, um, you know, so well building, obviously they put some standards around it. Um, in terms of kind of measuring, you know, how things might affect, uh, you know, your circadian, the circadian stimulus range, you can see here, it's basically a, um, it's a, it's a wavelength. So the human eye is, has a visual response curve and it's measured with this circadian uh, stimulus metric. And this is uh, being defined by the Lighting Research Center. Uh, and again, you know, we'll go through a little bit more detail about you know, what this means. So um, two different kind of metrics that are out there um, and people, depending on you know, what they're doing, they might use one or the other. There's a circadian stimulus metric. There's also this EML calculation, which is in well building. Um, but really, it has to do with both measures have to do with the amount of light that is, um, you know, uh, coming to the eye, right? So in the past, light was designed for, you know, here's how many foot candles we need at the desk level. That's what, you know, how many do we need on the wall? How many do we need on the floor? But now people are looking more at, you know, how much light is actually getting to the eye. And that's how they're looking uh, for measuring the visual response. And so if we look here, you can see, you know, the effects of that, um, the CS metric, uh, a 0.7 is kind of low melatonin levels in bright light and a 0.1 has high melatonin levels in dim light. Um, so again, if you're talking about what you're trying to do with, you know, either, um, you know, suppressing melatonin or, or, you know, trying to increase melatonin, these are going to be very important. And so if you look at, really here on the, on the chart, um, you know, at 7 a.m., 
you know, you want a uh, circadian stimulus of greater than 0.3. So this is kind of a bright bluish white light in the morning. And then as you can see throughout the day, you know, that illuminance level comes down a little bit as you get towards the night, you can see where um, that circadian stimulus is going to be, you know, less than 0.1, right? Because you don't want a lot of light, uh, it's going to disrupt, um, you know, some of the phys physiological things that are happening. So the important qualities of that light we talked about before is, you know, the, the timing of that light, you know, when are you getting these certain light levels, um, the duration of that light, how much, you know, again, you can see here in the morning coming from 7 a.m. to about, you know, 1130 noon, right, where the sun is at its highest. Uh, and then starting to come down from there. And then uh, at night, really disrupting, you know, not not having bright light, you know, that light becomes a little bit warmer. And you, you'll probably notice that on your phone if you have, uh, you know, some of these new smartphones, you know, they have a, a night mode or an amber mode. And, you know, you can set that to basically when the sun sets every night, you know, your phone can go into an amber mode. And you'll notice that the intensity of your screen goes down as well as the the color uh, becomes moves you know shifts to an amber color and again that's all to kind of help your your brain give you the message that okay it's you know we've moved into uh, a different time of day and it's time to kind of slow down so who's at risk right for being most out of sync i think obviously the the ones that come to mind are any type of healthcare workers um, any type of people that are working doing a lot of shift work. Um, that's obviously really important. And then, you know, when we look at um, things like even office workers, right, especially in the winter months, right? So if we look at, uh, you know, office workers in Seattle, uh, where the night, you know, is, is comes pretty early in the winter, uh, and already, you know, you're not getting a lot of natural sunlight. Uh, obviously, that's, you know, that's creating uh, you know, different moods in those people, but similar in schools as well, right? Because you may be going to, you know, the kids uh, may be going to school when it's dark out and they may only, you know, be, you know, outside for maybe an hour or two before it gets dark again. So um, those are things that um, can really affect and, and get people out of their uh, circanium entrainment. And obviously just in general, anyone who spends a lot of time indoors, right? Because if you're being exposed to the old fluorescent parabolic <laughs> louvered fixtures, right? I mean, uh, that are, you know, a lot of those fluorescent bulbs may be out or they may be super dimmed and no one's come to replace them. That's obviously um, something that's going to have effect uh, that you're not getting the right amount of light um, at the eye during the right amount of time that you need it. Um, we also have, uh, you know, PNNL, which is a, you know, basically a group that looks at um, these lighting recommendations. So, um, you know, you obviously want to make sure that you're not, um, you know, overusing, you know, the consumption, the power consumption of light, uh, but that you're getting the right amount of light that you need at the time. So um, part of that problem was, okay, how do we basically create a clear and consistent design criteria um, that leads to the right amount of design light for the space while not wasting energy. And again, these are just the, kind of the two metrics. So if you're if you're thinking about circadian and you know the, the lighting discussion around circadian, these are kind of the two top um, measurements that are being used in well building uh, or being used in different qualifications for uh, circadian lighting. So what are some of the key applications? Um, things like tunable white, meaning light that changes color and intensity over the day. Um, obviously, we talked a lot about controls, you know, the teachers and, and even students in some cases having control of what that light level should be, um, circadian, and then obviously meeting some well-building standards. So again, a lot of these have different benefits uh, that you can see there on the right to create either visual cues, improve learning. We obviously see, you know, if you take the intensity of light up during test time and you make the light a little bit cooler, there are effects that students actually test better versus the same thing where you're, you're taking, you know, after recess when the students are, you know, excited, they've been outside, they've been having fun and they don't realize that even though they're in a classroom that recess is over, you know, you have the ability to dim the lights, make them a little bit warmer and that's shown to um, 
put the students a little bit more at ease. So we have a few different uh, case studies, right? So it's always good to understand, you know, who's done this, right? I don't want to be the first one, you know, who, who's done this, who's, who's done some studies on, you know, health and wellness and lighting. Um, and this is all through, you know, the, the DOE uh, gateway program. But the first one is, um, you know, this Carrollton Farmers Branch Independent School District in Texas. So they took um, three grade school classrooms. They uh, enabled this tunable white LED system. And again, you can see what that means here is, um, you know, you're looking at different intensity of light, you're looking at different color, and which is spectrum, and then you're looking at different durations, right? And so there's a control pad per classroom with these presets. And really, again, we they made it very simple. There's a reading preset, a testing, a general, which is, you know, just general classroom, and then an energy, meaning to give people in that in that space some extra energy. So there are also four preset scenes, uh, full light, AV, presentation mode or dim, and then buttons kind of on, off, up, down. So, you know, some of the findings around that were teachers use the scene buttons regularly during the day. Um, so they really liked having the ability to control um, the scene of their classroom. The um, the, the SBD buttons, which is a, the, the color buttons, weren't used as much, um, but they they did feel that the lighting improved the learning environment. So, in addition to spending all that time on creating their um, uh, creating their lesson plans, you know, having the ability to to change the light in those different spaces felt like they were more being more interactive with the students. Uh, also, uh, another one was uh, in, in Folsom, Cordova in California. Um, they took three grade school classrooms and used these tunable white systems. Uh, you can see they had these sliders, uh, which again had to do with intensity of light and also color. Um, and again, they were looking at morning light design for circadian, right? So 0.3 uh, and then you know having that kind of change throughout the day. Um, some of the findings there were that they also use these color tuning uh, systems regularly. So the teachers really like having the ability to alter and, and change the environment depending on what they're, they're teaching. And they had a calm setting as well. Um, and it was almost used daily at 8.30 and 1.30 p.m. So, uh, you know, probably to get the, the, the students going in the beginning of the day uh, to, to kind of realize that, you know, they weren't on the bus anymore, they were in the classroom. And then probably after lunch or something where they needed a, a cue to get the kids to, um, to pay attention a little bit more. So based off of this, you know, what we've learned is, you know, capturing the, nat the, the essence of natural light is really important, right? So while we can't, the reality is we can't be outside all day. We, we need to, you know, do our jobs. We need to be in a warehouse or in an education space, uh, or we need to be in a classroom learning. So how do we is there a way that we can capture, you know, what's happening uh, outside in terms of the spectrum and the intensity and all those factors that we talked about, um, about how health and wellness can affect lighting? And, and so that was kind of the question that, you know, we posed to ourselves. Um, you know, people are forced to be inside. It's not natural for them. You know, uh, people, people yearn to be outside. They want to be sitting next to the window. Uh, they want to have the corner office. So how do we enable that? And, you know, one idea that, that we've uh, launched in the last year was let's create a skylight. Um, so let's create a, a skylight that can be integrated into classrooms, uh, education uh, spaces, uh, the, you know, uh, lobbies, offices, uh, all those different types of spaces to give people in those spaces a, a touchstone to what's actually going on outside. And if we look at how this is designed, it was really thought with the intent of creating a separate sky and sun, right? So you can see here, it's kind of a two by two housing with a uh, eight inch or a five inch regress, and then a full kind of eight inch housing, which you know basically sits inside where a, where a troffer might sit in your ceiling in a classroom. And we have a, a, you know, a blue sky that sits up top, and then we have these four sun panels that kind of go around the side. And you'll see that you know there's uh, kind of a west west panel and an east panel, and we'll we'll show you what that means. But the whole idea of this is around just all the things that we just talked about, right? The sun is moving across the sky; it's getting brighter. 
it's getting dimmer, it's getting cooler, it's getting warmer. How do we emulate that and give people in that space a touchstone to what's going on? So this product kind of en enables that, you know, it's a dynamic solution, meaning it's constantly changing. And it allows the teacher in the space or it allows the superintendent of, of a school district or the principal of a school um, to really design a space that is most conducive to learning. And that's allowing the students and the teachers uh, and the administrators in that space to really have a connection with what's going on outside. So you can imagine, you know, a fixture in the sky and you can imagine, you know, in the early morning, you see it's these panels on the right side are warm and they're giving off a glow as if the sun is rising in the east. And you can see that the, the, the sky is, is, is lit blue, but it's, it's not super bright yet um, around 6 or 7 a.m. And then as the day goes, this light around these sun panels is actually going to, you know, become more intense. Um, the color temperature is going to move from a warm color temperature to a more uh, a cool color temperature. And then similarly, as you go towards the sunset, you'll see now these two panels on the left side are lit. And they're going to give you the idea that there's a sunset and give you a really nice warm feeling. So again, allowing the people in that space to actually and again, this is going to happen very slowly, right? So it's not going to be noticed necessarily. Uh, you're not going to see big jumps of color or, or lumen uh, intensity, but it's going to be a nice, smooth curve as you go throughout the day. And this is just how it all, you know, again, comes together. So you have these, you know, put four of these skylights, you have a wireless gateway, and then a touch screen, uh, which goes on the wall. So this would act like your, you know, again, we talked about in those um, research um, that the DOE had done, they had some type of touch screen or touch panel. So this is just like a, like a, you know, again, like a, a Samsung Galaxy touchpad. Um, so very easy for people in the space to run their different profiles. And you can imagine if you start to think about these and, and where you would put them in education spaces, you know, you're talking about libraries that don't maybe have access to windows. You're talking about classrooms. Uh, and again, allowing those spaces to uh, really emulate um, kind of a natural day. So kind of in summary, you know, we're looking at, um, you know, what are the lighting design considerations for these educational spaces? Um, obviously, it's important to have enough light to support health and well-being. So being aware of not only the energy implications, but if you're really interested in meeting circadian lighting guidelines, knowing what those are, right? So that the well building, you know, the IES working with the well building on what those design practices should be. You want to make sure that, you know, whoever you're working with to design these lighting spaces is aware of that and, and hears you that, that you want to make sure that you're designing um, for not just visibility, but also for health and wellness for your students and teachers. And then, you know, review ongoing uh, releases of these case studies, right? So that's, you know, what you saw was only a few of, of what's out there. So again, if you go to kind of the DOE and, and you look for um, you know, these circadian case studies, you can find them specifically tied to schools. There's a lot more um, that, that you can read up on and, and kind of self-educate. And there's, again, lots of different viewpoints and directions, right? So you need to think about um, the extra design time and the budget that may be required. So you know, if you're on a very tight budget, um, you know, designing for color tunable systems or designing some of those skylights in may not work unless you're willing to kind of sacrifice in a different area to, to make kind of maybe uh, make a little bit more money for the lighting design aspect. Um, but ultimately, you know, if you're looking at redesigning or renovating or new construction, I mean, building in with flexibility of color tunable systems or, or systems that have open API controls allow you to kind of future-proof your uh, educational facilities, meaning even if you're not ready to use these systems today, by deciding and designing around um, these new um, uh, control-type fixtures, you'll have or be enabled uh, to open up that uh, ability to do that you know, down the road when you actually um, maybe have the budget or, or you're looking to, to do that. So, um, and just being aware of that, you know, again, light is not just for visibility. It does have uh, biological and behavioral effects, um, and that's just very important to keep in mind. And with that,
we've concluded. And uh, so I think we'll, if there's any time, we'll open it up for some questions. Let's see what we've got. Um, all right, we'll start with this one. How uh, do UV, how does UV affect health and tasks? Right. So um, obviously UV is part of the uh, of the spectrum and, and generally part of the invisible spectrum. So, um, you know, there are right now when we talk about um, the visible spectrum, um, there's generally no UV, you know, in that wavelength. Um, where UV becomes uh, more of an interesting topic is uh, in this disinfectant uh, lighting, right? So with, with COVID and everything that's going on there, we're seeing more and more uh, UV, uh, you know, ultraviolet lighting solutions that are being designed in or, or looking to be designed in to, you know, basically help um, eliminate uh, the different varying types of bacteria and germs. Um, so, you know, there's, there's, there's products uh, that, that actually, you know, take a UV light and they'll shine it um, up, up on the ceiling and that's called a kind of an upper room uh, fixture and what that's doing is because UV light obviously can can be detrimental to to people right you can't you can't be shining you know for a long period of time UV light down um, uh, because obviously that's what you know we get from the Sun uh, you're able to actually shine the UV light up and it actually creates uh, you know, uh, the, the light spectrum actually is, uh, you know, killing some of those and disinfecting uh, some of those, those germs that might be out there. So I think you're going to hear more and more about, um, you know, about UV lighting in, in, the, in the form of disinfectant lighting as we move forward. Okay. Um, next one, how do you account for kids who have sensitivity to light in a class with kids who do not have that condition? Yeah, that's that's um, that's a great question. Now, the great thing about um, control lighting is you can actually create groups. So, if you can imagine a, a classroom of sixteen uh, desks, uh, you could actually take uh, you know four a quadrant of those desks, and you could move students uh, that have a, a higher effect or you know a higher um, uh, visual discomfort, and you could put them kind of in that four desk quadrant. You could then uh, even though all these these four quadrants, the lighting fixtures would all be connected into one network, uh, you could actually set the scene for that four quadrant to be, let's say, 20 to 30 percent lower than the other quadrants, right? So by simply, uh, you know, maybe moving students around in a classroom and then having these smart controls, you're able to actually create kind of, you know, these these micro. Um, these micro areas that can be a little bit more customized to the students that are sitting in that space. Okay. Uh, and I think we will end with this question because we are over time. Um, what type of uh, spacing for skylights is needed? I'm not which skylight they're referring to specifically, but. Yeah, sorry. Just can you repeat the, the front part of that question? Yeah. They're asking what type of spacing for the skylight is needed. So oh, gotcha. Sure yeah. So, so the good thing about this is that they actually fit into the existing um, two by two spacing uh, in a plenum. So, again, you, you need about uh, they're about eight inches uh, in depth. So you just want to make sure um, you know that you don't have a if you have a super super skinny plenum or you have a lot going on in the plenum. You just want to make sure that you know, you can kind of poke your head up there and, and make sure that you have, you know, at least eight inches, maybe plus another, you know, half inch for the conduit coming out the top. Um, but uh, as long as you have the, the the plenum space, they basically sit into a, a standard T grid or into a drywall grid, which could be put into a hard ceiling. So from a form factor perspective, they are, you know, from an installation perspective, they would install the same way you would install a two by two uh, trough or fixture. Okay. All right. As I said, I think we will wrap it there. Um, before we sign off, I would like to take a minute to thank uh, Jeff and also just thank our sponsor, Cree Lighting. Uh, I would also like to remind everyone that uh, the webcast uh, on-demand version will be available on uh, the AC website uh, fairly shortly uh, and will be available for a year uh, from now uh, for your viewing at your leisure. Uh, the link to that recording will be sent to you via email within the next 24 hours. Uh, beyond that, thank you so much for attending and have a wonderful remainder of your day.